in April of this year, 2024, the results of a UK-based study were published. In the study, medical researchers followed over 8,000 people over a decade. They measured what they called a patient's loss of visual sensitivity. From this, investigators thought they were able to predict the onset of cognitive impairment fully 12 years before any other symptoms of dementia manifested. The possible application of this for the early detection of Alzheimer's and other related dementias is obvious. So in this video, I'll take a brief look at some of the media reports. In a previous video, I outlined various ways that Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia can and often do negatively affect the five senses. And once upon a time, I mentioned vision testing as among the available, albeit not entirely reliable, varieties of Alzheimer's screening procedures. Recently, there's been a noteworthy development. But first, let's tackle a few preliminaries. First of all, this was a prospective cohort study. This is where investigators track a group of generally similar people over time to see if specific differences have an effect on some outcome. In this case, the outcome is an individual displaying some clinically significant symptom of cognitive impairment or dementia. And the specific difference is dissimilarities in visual sensitivity. So secondly, what the heck does visual sensitivity come down to? Well, in some contexts, we might be thinking about things such as the annoying effects of light changes. You know, we often speak about someone having a sensitivity to certain kinds of light bulb or to fluorescence, but not in this case. Here, the study was concerned with something like the intersection between motion perception and pattern recognition. The abstract for the study, available on PubMed, uses the phrase visual processing speed. Specifically, test subjects were asked to push a button when they saw a triangle appear out of a jumble of moving dots. Given this background, we can simply state the relevant findings. For example, one journalist summarized a pertinent conclusion this way. People who developed dementia were slower to see the on-screen triangle than people who never manifested dementia. At least, one presumes, not before the study terminated. So, people who would eventually get some form of bona fide dementia took longer to spot a shape forming out of an otherwise presumably chaotic assortment of digital dots in motion than other people did. There is an obvious summary comment that can be made about all the diagnostic possibilities. Namely, early detection would, in theory, give healthcare providers an opportunity to introduce a wider variety of possible interventions. And that's with the obvious caveat that given the scientific knowledge that we have at present, there is no intervention given at any stage that's considered curative. Still, there are lingering questions. For example, number one, was the study complete enough or long enough? The force of the study's conclusions depend on a sharp distinction being drawn between those who were tested who never developed dementia and those who were tested who did develop dementia. And then the idea is the visual sensitivity makes the difference diagnostically in identifying the two different groups or predicting who will be in one or the other group. But using only the easily discoverable press reports, I was unable to determine whether the study terminated with the death of the participants or whether it was simply ended with some or all of them still alive. Now, why would that matter? Well, it's certainly possible that some people who were counted among those who remained without dementia would have manifested Alzheimer's-like symptoms had the study gone on even longer. In fact, it's possible that they did develop Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia in private life and that it was simply invisible to the study because it had ended already. Mind you, I don't know if that happened. I'm simply saying, based on the reports I've seen, it can't be ruled out. And bear in mind, we might be talking only about an extension of a few months, certainly if we extended it several years in advance, assuming that the study participants weren't all dead, then those extra years might have made a huge impact and a huge difference to the outcome of the study. The second question is, can we differentiate a vision problem related to the eyes from one that is related to the brain? Human vision is not exactly analogous to, say, a video camera. 
That is, we can test a video camera by seeing if it's producing the expected output. And if we're not getting the output that we expect, and we're sure that our monitors are in working order and everything's plugged in, then we can disassemble the offending equipment and run diagnostics until we find which component or which series of components failed. But human beings aren't so simple. And in fact, the precise description of what even goes on when we're talking about vision is not uncontroversial. Now, trying to be as philosophically neutral as possible, let me say just as a first pass that what we see with human vision is a function of our optical apparatus, that is to say our eyes with all their parts, in conjunction with our interpretive faculties. So that would be the brain, the nervous system, and so on. Now recall here, please, that I have a video overview of the vexed question of the existence of a mind or a soul. So the fact that I'm framing this particular point in terms of a physicalist description of a human being doesn't mean that that is uncontroversial. It's certainly not uncontroversial. But without wading into those deep waters again, we might summarize the situation simply by saying, that vision is a combination of conceptual and perceptual factors. Or, if you like, it's a combination of cognitive and non-cognitive factors. And I think that general description can be endorsed by people regardless of whether or not they are physicalists or dualists or wherever they might fall along that more complicated spectrum. But just having a cognitive and a non-cognitive component to the analysis complicates the overall picture, no pun intended. And that leads to another question. Number three, are these vision problems predictors of future dementia or just symptoms of present dementia? If the problems with visual processing speed turn out to be cognitive, then you might think that the contemplated vision testing isn't really predicting the future onset of some cognitive impairment. Rather, the vision test on that analysis would be detecting an already present cognitive impairment. In other words, it's possible that this vision test is simply picking up on the very first traces of symptoms of a dementia that's already in place, but at a very, very early stage. I don't say that this sort of early detection isn't or wouldn't be helpful if it turned out that it was only picking up on a dementia that was already in place. After all, as stated several times, early detection, whatever that comes down to in this case, presumably would have or could have major benefits. I'm simply saying that detection and prediction are not the same thing, and that they are hard to separate, especially in this case. And so you should bear that in mind. Finally, as with so many different news alerts when it comes to Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's research, we should probably maintain a posture of hopefulness but not over-exuberance or over-enthusiasm. In other words, we shouldn't put too much hope in a particular intervention or test or whatever the case may be, because we still are at a very early stage, frankly, of understanding what Alzheimer's is actually caused by and how to treat it. For one thing, according to the study's abstract, investigators admit that other more commonly used cognitive dementia screening tests were better predictors of future dementia risk than the vision test is or would be. For example, two tests that still work better overall are the Extended Mental State Exam, the EMSE, which is a supposedly beefed up version of the Mini Mental State Examination, or MMSE, that is evidently used in the United Kingdom, as well as the Hopkins Verbal Learning Test, or HVLT, which is designed to assess one's ability to acquire and recall information. The phrase verbal information here simply denotes words, whether conveyed in speech or in writing. I do want to stress that I only looked at journalistic summaries of this research. I did not pull the actual articles themselves from the academic journals, and the reason for that was simply lack of time. If there's sufficient interest, I may take a more detailed look, but it would take longer. And if you are interested in that, then I would invite you to comment below. Feel free to share your own opinion or your own research as well, and certainly let me know if you'd be interested in that kind of a deeper dive. Still, even though I only took a kind of superficial view of this, I did think that the item was newsworthy enough to share. 
Speaking of that, speaking of sharing, please like, share, and subscribe if you found something of interest in the video. At this point, those kinds of requests are probably commonplace, they might even be annoying to you, but they really do go quite a distance in terms of helping out the channel, and by extension, supporting my efforts to bring this kind of information to you. But either way, I thank you so much for watching this video, and I look forward to seeing you again in another one. Thanks so much.